Hello to everyone. My name is is Maria Victoria Mateos from Salamanca in Spain and it is my great pleasure to share with you the data from this randomized phase 3 dream study conducted in relapsed refractory myeloma patients in which belantamaf mafodotin in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone was compared with standard of care daratumumab in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone. As uh, you know, multiple myeloma patients uh, do usually receive uh, proteasome inhibitors, emits uh, anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies as part of the first line of therapy. This means that uh, some of these patients are triple class exposed when they arrive to the second line of therapy. This uh, highlights the needs for drugs with a different mechanism of action. And belantamaf and is the first BCMA antibody drug conjugated with monomethyl auristatin F, and it has been combined with bortezomib and dexamethasone in the experimental arm of this DREAM7 study. The control arm was daratumumab in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone, and the population was relapsed refractory myeloma patients after at least one prior line of therapy. Patients received eight cycles consisting of Belamaf plus BD or Daratumumab BD, followed by Belamaf monotherapy or Daratumumab monotherapy as continuous therapy until progressive disease and acceptable toxicity with withdrawal of consent or death. The primary endpoint of this study was to evaluate the progression free survival. The baseline characteristics of the patients were well balanced in both arms. And just to note that the vast majority of the patients had been previously exposed to bortezomib, and approximately 50% of the patients had been previously exposed to lenalidomide, and 33% of the patients were indeed refractory to daratumumab. And basically, very few patients had been previously exposed to daratumumab because the refractoriness to daratumumab was an exclusion criterion. The primary endpoint progression for survival was met in the DREAM7 study. And here you can see how Bella VD resulted into a significantly longer median progression for survival, 36.6 months, in comparison with the bortezomib dexamethasone plus daratumumab, the median progression for survival was 13.4 months. This uh, translated into a hazard ratio of 0.41. And from the clinical point of view, this uh, benefit means that uh, the median progression for survival for Bella VD was uh, 23 months longer than uh, for patients who receive data in combination with VD. In addition, the superiority of Bella VD was consistent across all different pre-specified subgroup of patients, including those patients with the disease refractory to lenalidomide or patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. But this slide is also important because this is the overall survival. And in spite of the overall survival follow-up is ongoing, and these data are quite premature, you can see how there is a clear trend favoring Bella VD versus Dara VD in terms of overall survival. And 54 events have occurred in Bella VD and 87 in Dara VD with a hazard ratio of 0.57. In terms of overall response rate, Bella VD was also superior to Dara VD. But I would like to note the complete response or better because 34.6% of the patients achieved at least CR in the Bella VD arm versus 17 in the Dara VD. So this means that Bella VD resulted in the double of a CR rate or better. But also minimal residual disease negativity rate was evaluated and in those patients achieving at least complete response and in the intent to treat patient population, 25% of the patients receiving Bella VD were in MRT negative versus 9.6% in the Dara VD. The durability of the response 
although the majority of the patients in the experimental arm are ongoing in response, durability was also significantly longer. I previously said that the benefit of Bella VD was observed across the different pre-specified subgroup of patients. But I would like to pay your attention to the benefit in the lane refractory population. In the left-hand side of the slide, we can see how the superiority for Bella VD is remarkable in the population refractory to lenalidomide. Dara VD in this population resulted in a median PFS of 8.6 months, and Bella VD resulted in a median progression for survival of 25 months. And the same benefit was also observed in the lane refractory population in terms of overall response rate, as well as a complete response rate or better and even minimal residual disease negativity rate, 5.7% for DARA-VD, 25.3% for DELA-VD. But another important group of patients are those with high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities. In the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the benefit for DELA-VD over DARA-VD in patients with high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities, and Bella VD resulted in a median PFS of 33.2 months. When we look into the benefit in a standard risk population, it's important to see how Bella VD in the standard risk resulted in a median PFS of 36.6 months. When we compare these 36.6 months in standard risk and 33.2 months in the high risk, the conclusion is the addition of a belantamaf mafodotin to bortezomib and dexamethasone is basically able to overcome the poor prognosis of the presence of high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. And this is extremely important the benefit is also observed in terms of overall response rate, complete response rate or better, and also in terms of minimal residual disease negativity rate. In terms of a safety profile, I would say that the safety and tolerability were consistent with the known safety profile of the individual agents. Overall, as the durability of the treatment was longer for Bella VD than Dara VD, the incidence of any adverse event, grade three, four adverse events, or either serious adverse event was slightly higher for Bella VD. But when this incident was adjusted to the time of exposition, the difference is not so evident. However, you know that one of the most relevant adverse events that we can see when we treat our myeloma patients with belantamaf mafodotin is the ocular toxicity. This slide summarizes the main findings based on ocular toxicity we've seen in the DREAM7. We are going to focus on patient receiving Bella VD. And here you can see three pictures in which we are going to see represented the best corrected visual acuity. In the left-hand side of the slide, this is the normal visual acuity 2020. And this was the situation basically for all patients at the moment of starting treatment with Bella VD. In the middle, you can see how we can present after treatment with belantamab mafodotin, blurred vision. This means that the visual acuity decreases to 2050. And in the right-hand side of the slide, we can see what we can call impaired vision, when, when the visual acuity worsened to 2200. It's important to note how the majority, 34% of the patients treated with Bella VD, experienced a deterioration of the visual acuity to 2050. And only 2% of the patients experienced a worsening of the visual acuity to 2200. So this means that the majority of the ocular toxicities are going to be in the middle. But it is important also to note how the vast majority, basically all patients, resolved the visual acuity throughout the delays interruptions, and some patients had to discontinue treatment, but this occurred in only 9% of the patients. The main reason 
is because we learned how to manage this ocular toxicity. And the first important consideration is to expand the number of weeks, so to increase the number of weeks between the two PELAMAF administration. This is what it is represented in this graph. We've seen how at the beginning, belantamab was given every three weeks. But throughout the treatment, the median weeks between two doses of belamab increased. And you can see here how some patients receive belamab every 11 or even every 12 weeks. This didn't impact into the efficacy and patients in which the delay was necessary. The median progression of survival was the same, 36.6 months, but it's important to see how this dose modification influenced reducing significantly the incidence of ocular events and especially a significant reduction in the number of patients who had to discontinue because of ocular events. This means that now, we know how to manage the ocular toxicity. And indeed, when the quality of life was evaluated, you can see how no differences in global quality of life was observed between Bella VD and Dara VD arms over time. In conclusion, I would say that the math in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone can be a new standard of care in relapsed refractory myeloma patients after at least one prior line of therapy. I think DREAM7 met its primary endpoint with an excellent benefit in progression for survival, as well as an overall response rate, complete response rate or better, and even minimal residual disease negativity rate. But for the patients, from the patient perspective, it is very important to inform about the safety and tolerability. And the ocular adverse events, patients have to know that they were generally reversible, manageable with the dose modification, and led to low treatment discontinuations. And those modifications did not impact the progression for survival. And I think that this is what we will do in the clinical practice when this combination is available to start with the belantamab every three weeks. But as soon as ocular toxicity is present, we will be able to plan a dose modification, especially increasing the interval between two Bellamab doses, and this will allow to maintain the efficacy and to decrease the toxicity. In addition, we've seen how this combination is very effective in the land refractory population, and this is a challenging population that we see today basically in all patients at the moment of the first relapse. And also it is very important to recognize the efficacy observed in patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. So I consider that this combination together with another BELA-based combination, in this case with pomalidomide and dexamethasone, will represent new, two new options of therapy for relapsed refractory myeloma patients. And here you can see all countries in which the DREAM7 has been conducted, indicating that this is a global clinical study. And of course, I would like to finalize saying thanks to all patients and to all people involved in this clinical study. Thank you very much for your attention.